Uh, and we're just gonna take the position and um, the yeah, and then I'll, I'll <laughs> turn on yeah. the amplifier. Okay, so you are you're allowed to stand on the table. So, so you should. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, so you should. <laughs> yeah. I'll present from uh, up here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's not good because this is our camera and you have uh, to be behind uh, the camera. Yes, <laughs> yeah, right. I'll have to stay here for the camera then. A, 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 little, a little bit there of is, is good, yeah. No, that's, that's, a, that's okay. So, uh, first of all, welcome. What I'll do, I'll, I'll mute um, here the, uh, the audience um, and I'll mute later on uh, for, the, for the questions. So welcome um, to the today's VR cast. It's a great pleasure to have you here again. I think it's now the third already. Uh, we have some amazing guests in the game today. Uh, a very special guest, um, Jeremy Dalton, who came over from the UK, um, where he's the head of um, yes, yeah, exactly. Oh no, that's oh. oops. Oh, sorry. Oh, I'm here. I'm coming back. <laughs> sorry, I'm back. I'm back again. <laughs> Ah, there you go. <laughs> that was all. VR so, Jeremy, <laughs> Jeremy is the head of uh, VR and AR PwC UK, and um, and you published a very interesting uh, study report recently before COVID. Um, seeing is believing, and um, and that's why I thought it would be great to have you here on this VR cast on behalf of basically of the VR Business Club again, uh, who is hosting this event. Um, and we really look forward to um, the conversation with the presentation. What we did um, in uh, ahead of the ahead of the session, we said let's let's put a little bit of perspective, obviously, on the uh, specific COVID situation, because obviously I think that, and we will talk about that. That is going to change how VR and AR are seen, how it's developing, and uh, and uh, what it does to the you know, to the overall let's say, um, kind of use of, um, of these new technologies. Yeah, we see that digital transformation really driven by that. Um, and uh, and that uh, applies for VR as well. So with that, again, um, Jeremy, welcome. And um, yeah, the stage um, is yours. And uh, we look forward to a couple of interesting minutes here in front of the Golden Gate Bridge. Perfect. Thanks a lot for that, Michael. Appreciate you having me. And can I suggest, though, and um, if there is no background noise, can we have everyone unmuted so they can ask questions throughout the presentation? I quite like sure, that. Sure, I, uh, I did that. That's yeah, I did that. Activity. Absolutely. Yeah. So Perfect. if someone has so background, background okay. noise, yeah, if someone has not background noise, just kind of go on mute. That's fine. Yeah. So if you have a crying baby next to you, then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But otherwise, can, can everyone say something? Just say hi. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Yeah, is it working? Can you guys? I want to see if Hi. I can hear you. Yeah. Hello. Hi. I'm Tracy. Uh, yes. Good. Good. Yeah. Brilliant. 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 Okay, sound is coming through. Okay. Excellent. So what I would say is I I have some slides here which I'm more than happy to go through. Uh, but if you have something you want to say or you have an area you're interested mm -hmm. in discussing a little bit more, then just you know ask me in the middle of the presentation. Feel free to interrupt me. And we can go along a different direction to the sort of stuff you're interested in, and uh, we'll take it from there. Does that sound good? Absolutely. Perfect. Sounds very good. Yes. All right. Very good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So let's yeah. see if I can switch to the next slide. There we yes. go. Yes. Brilliant. Yeah. Good. So, uh, as Michael mentioned, I'll be talking a little bit about VR and AR and their use in business, and I will bring in the seeing in seeing is believing report that we released uh, late last year. But I will preface it uh, with a bit of uh, with a bit of news around um, uh, COVID and our, our analysis on that situation. So, firstly, um, addressing the 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 elephant in the room, although it's not so much an elephant anymore because we all we're all happy to bring it up. Uh, the COVID nineteen situation is uh, is pretty <laughs> the, the the English word that tends to get used a lot now and is overused, in fact is the word unprecedented. So uh, this is one of the most unprecedented situations in recent human history that has led to us all now changing the way we work and the way we live to a large extent. Now, obviously that is going to affect the, it's going to affect every one of these industries. And in fact, every industry is being impacted by COVID. This particular slide or the next two, three slides are an extract from a report 
that uh, our PwC UK economics team put together and releases every week. So this is the update that came out this morning. So this is brand new. Uh, you, I don't think you can get news any fresher than this. <coughs> I literally put it into the slide deck this morning bef before sending to Michael. So feel free to, uh, if you can't read it, you can come up, up front here. But um, this basically shows the gray bars uh, in here, the short term impact on these industries due to COVID and the red bars, the extensions of the gray bars, they are what we expect to happen in the longer term. So if COVID becomes a situation where lockdown uh, becomes a long term thing rather than a short term thing, we should, ex we should expect to see the impacts extend along these red bars. If we're locked down for the shorter term, then we expect the impact to be along these shorter gray bars here. So you have a list of industries on the side there. The most hard hit industries are going to be the food service industry, the hotels industry and transportation. They're going to get hit very hard in the food sector in particularly, possibly up to 41 percent decrease in the GVA. Now, GVA is gross value added. What that means in layperson's terms is this is the economic impact of these particular industries, their contribution to the economy and how much it's going to be affected. Now, a few other industries are getting a hit, but not to as much of a large extent as the food um, services industry. Let me just see if I can. Can I point with my finger? Oh, it doesn't allow me to do. I, that's the best I can do. <laughs> That'll do. <laughs> food service industry, hotels and transport. <clears throat> then we have other sectors like um, the leisure and arts, real estate, construction, manufacturing, also getting hit hard, but not as hard. But then you have some sectors here towards the bottom as well. Uh, sectors like utilities, uh, finance and insurance, information and telecoms. Yes, they're being affected, but not to a massively large extent as the food industry. So we're talking about minus 1% to minus 5% here, even in the worst case, longer term, uh, should we be uh, locked down for the longer term. And then, in fact, you actually have some industries here, these last three, they are also... Um, they are not only, they're not being negatively impacted. In fact, they're being positively impacted by COVID, uh, if you can have such a thing. Uh, those are the education, public administration, defense, and the health and social care industry at the bottom here. Now, health and social care is understandable. Um, public spending, that is understandable as well in terms of the, uh, the economic impact, because obviously uh, a lot of governments are now putting um, fiscal policies in place. Uh, to manage this uh, situation and um, education as well showing a very slight bump there potentially of you know up to one percent which is quite interesting and i suppose a possible explanation for that is a lot of people like yourselves uh, have a lot of time now or or are in an area at home that is more accessible and more conducive to doing educational style courses and presentations so the big lesson there is lots of industries are being impacted, but not every industry is being absolutely you know, annihilated by COVID. And some industries like healthcare are in fact, uh, their economic impact is, is increasing. So um, we go Jeremy, to the Jeremy, yeah. Jeremy I, I'd, I'd like to have, uh, ask a question straight on here. I yeah, think sure. it's fascina fascinating and, and, and at the same time horrifying. Um, because the, the question then becomes, yeah, when you have a decrease of, I mean, even 10% yeah, in an industry, um, yeah. the, the, the actual impact on the organizations, the companies um, are, are massive. I mean, a, a lot of organizations yeah, in quite a few industries, logistics as an example, yeah, I mean, they live off tiny margins, retail, yeah. Yeah, they live off tiny, I mean, they suffering already from just from the Amazon phenomenon, which only takes away 8% basically, or 10% um, of the volume yeah, before COVID. So how do you see, how do you see that? I mean, a, a 30% in hotels, is there, is there a hotel industry afterwards? It's, it is pretty devastating. And uh, you're right, we shouldn't be complacent by looking at, you know, relatively small numbers like minus three to minus five. In fact, you see this line here, that's the whole of the UK average. The UK GDP is expected to, to decrease by minus four to minus eight percent this year. So this is not uh, 
it's certainly not an insignificant uh, impact on the, the economic environment of these industries. Um, but at the end of the day, I'll show you the good news, which relates yes. to your question on the next slide here. Yep, great. Although we are looking at a pretty devastating decrease, now there are three lines here. There's baseline, which is the dotted line. Now that's what we would expect to happen if there was no COVID, that red line there. Um, then we've got the gray line here, and that is the effect due to COVID if we have a shorter lockdown. Um, and then you have the black line here, and that is the effect due to COVID if we have a longer lockdown. Now, regardless of whether it's short or long, the impact is not going to be, or we don't expect it to be sustained. So yes, there is a massive dip and a pretty devastating dip, but that dip is by no means permanent. And we're hoping mm -hmm. for a recovery um, into, um, you know, starting at the, the third quarter of this year and moving into uh, the, uh, the, the Q1 of, of 2021 and so on. We should expect to see us recovering to almost baseline levels in the case of a shorter lockdown by about the quarter four of 2021. So the, the bad news is, yes, this is going to be a pretty devastating impact. The good news is that, as with most things, it will pass it will be temporary. We just need to be able to sustain ourselves until then. Uh, that may require, as we're seeing in many parts of the world, um, some government intervention as well. But yeah, absolutely. I think, good... I think there's some, some, yeah, there's, there are some good news. Absolutely. And yeah, of course, if, yeah, things, things will improve and get better again uh, after every single crisis. I think that's, um, that, that's, that's a positive outlook. I think it's still interesting to see and to consider what does it mean. I mean, for yeah, for all the organizations, you said that yeah. How do you sustain? How do you sustain? As in, I mean, Lufthansa, for example, dropped ninety eight percent. So they they go yeah. from, from three hundred fifty thousand flights uh, passengers to three thousand passengers, and and so it's like or hotels. Yeah, I mean, for the hotel industry, it's probably a six to nine to twelve months. Uh, massive reduction, which doesn't impact probably the the big ones, the Marriott Marriotts of the world, yeah. But a lot of the the mid-sized hotels and small hotels. I think that's where where we see a change, kind of yeah, in our in our economy and our society. Yeah, I, I definitely think it's not going to be an easy time, but uh, there will be light at the end of the tunnel. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, and then on to the next slide now. Uh, if any of you are interested in getting further updates on along this type, the there's a whole there's a whole PDF deck available with loads of uh, estimates, like assuming when vaccinations are going to take place, shorter lockdowns versus longer lockdowns, and uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions and how they're going to affect our recovery. All that sort of stuff you can download it at uh, bit.ly/covid19uk um, over there if you're interested. Just take a note of that. But I think, um, Michael, are you happy to send the deck out afterwards? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. If, if you're yeah, fine. Perfect. Um, yeah, good. Yeah, that's okay. In PDF format, it's okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So um, now we've, we've addressed the elephants in the room, COVID-19. This particular situation I'm going to talk about now is relating to our Seeing is Believing report. Now, this was done prior to uh, COVID-19 really hitting hard. But regardless of that, we still see these results as being relevant in the long term, because this was a long term economic outlook on the impact of virtual reality and augmented reality technologies. So the, the big question that we were trying to answer was how are these technologies going to affect the economy all the way through to 2030? And what you're seeing here are the buckets that we put all of the use cases into, um, as well as the uh, the figures at the bottom there, which relate to the economic impact of these buckets, uh, the virtual reality and augmented reality use cases, um, and how they affect, come together to affect the, uh, the economy positively and to what value. So starting with the left-hand side, product and service development. So this is all to do with stuff that we're experiencing right now, in fact, flexible working having collaborations and organizational meetings in virtual reality. And not only necessarily for presentations, but also for, um, for workshops and more deeper applications where we have to get together in groups, for example, and we have to start whiteboarding things where we have to get uh, you know, into 
a group of three over there in the corner and talk about electronics. And then over in this corner, we have four more people talking about, uh, you know, the user experience of the, uh, of the product. Virtual reality is a, uh, an, an augmented reality to a large extent, are great technologies to assist with this form of, of collaboration and working remotely. And in fact, these are the type of things that enable an increase in the productivity of the world and therefore an increase in the, in the positive economic impact in society. And, and connected to those points, design, visualization and build there. So that is all to do with, um, think of companies like Ford, you know, mo motor vehicles like that that have been using. In fact, actually, there's another one um, I want to bring up. Have you guys heard of... Um, it's called Man, Truck and Bus or Man, Bus and Truck. That group there, they do like, they basically do big vehicles. They're based in Germany. Uh, I can't remember which city now, uh, but they have, they've already invested in virtual reality through cave systems. So that it's not only um, Man that are doing that, but also uh, companies like Ford have been invested in virtual reality for more than a decade now. Uh, you've got companies like McLaren, that are doing the same thing. They're using virtual reality to design super vehicles in the, of the future. Um, and that's really interesting as well, because that gives you a lot of productivity gains uh, because you don't need to get people to come together physically anymore. You, you don't need to spend a lot of time and a lot of money producing physical prototypes of vehicles and waiting three weeks for this product to be built and then being able to feed back on it and having to wait another few weeks. Everything is done digitally. So people can instantly come in, see the design feedback, jump out, and then come in next day and see, see the reviewed version. So it enables us to speed up the development of these, uh, these products and services. And um, then in the healthcare world, this is the second biggest contributor um, in terms of virtual reality and augmented reality contributing to the global economy. So this is in, uh, this is in order. So we've got products and service development first, then we've got healthcare. Now, you may be wondering what has the VR and AR got to do with healthcare? Now, healthcare is incredibly, um, is incredibly ripe for using VR and AR technologies, not only for, for meetings and telepresence type surgeries. Uh, hold on, let me just uh, close my Mac sound so you guys don't get that sound coming. There we go. Um, it's also very useful for, um, for the training of doctors. So there's a company called Medical Realities, for example. They did live streaming, the, the world's first live stream of a surgery. And they did that in vir through virtual reality. And that enabled thousands of students from all over the world to be in the operating room with the nurses and the surgeons at the same time. Now, that's something that wouldn't even be possible in real life. So again, this is an example of virtual reality and augmented reality technology enabling us to be even more productive than we would otherwise be able to be. And also, it's, it's being used in a number of different ways to achieve a greater healthcare outcomes in VR. So you may have heard the stories. It's being used to manage symptoms of dementia. It's being used to treat phobias. Uh, it's being used to, uh, to manage PTSD in soldiers returning from war. It's being used in psychological conditions. Um, there are so many applications in healthcare, and that's why we see it as contributing such a large amount uh, to, the, uh, to the global economy by 2030. The next one is a very big <clears throat> bucket. Now, this you've probably heard all about, development and training. And we include education in this. The idea that we are no longer now limited to having to go to a physical place to gain education, to learn about the world, and to learn about the world in a stronger way than we've been able to do before. So obviously, VR and AR technology doesn't lend itself well to absolutely every subject, but it lends itself very well to a large number of subjects. You think about history and being able to put yourself in the middle of a scenario uh, that took place hundreds or, or thousands of years ago, and the impact that that would have on a learner and help them to remember that goes beyond just reading about it in a book and looking at some black and white grainy photos, even if they existed at the time. 
So we've also got um, process improvements alongside that in the next uh, in the next section. Now, process improvements is largely an augmented reality thing. That's the way we see it. So the idea being you can wear usually a head mounted display to allow yourself hands free access to equipment and you can have engineers from all over the world um, basically log in through your eyesight and see what you're seeing in the world and then circle in your reality about something they're trying to communicate to you about. So I'm sure if you've ever been on, uh, you know, on a, um, a call with tech support, or if someone's trying to explain something to you over the phone, it's a very difficult thing to do because you don't know exactly what the other person is seeing. And even if you do, even if you are able to see their view, you can't explain or articulate very easily what you want them to do. So there may be, you know, 10 dials in front of you, two switches, five wires. What, what button are you talking about? Uh, what am I supposed to click? Whereas if you had a feed directly into their view and the ability to circle a button which stays as locked to the real world button environment, then suddenly a very uh, efficient way of communicating instructions. So the whole idea of remote assistance is a big thing in, in, uh, in augmented reality that will help to increase productivity in the world across a number of industries. Um, and asset repair and maintenance as well, or even related to the previous point around training. If I have a complex piece of machinery, somebody can help me go through it. And it doesn't even have to be a human that helps me. You can use uh, computer vision technology so the, mach the, the, the system recognizes what machine you're looking at and then says, ah, OK, this is clearly uh, an elevator and this is the model of the elevator. Uh, if you're trying to perform a certain maintenance procedure, you need to first uh, engage the safety switch. The safety switch should be over here. Move to move forward, move forward, look right, look right. OK, there it is circled on the environment. And that means that organizations potentially save even more time and money in terms of the training that they have to perform for employees, because effectively the the computer system is training them because the computer system can now see what we're seeing in the real world and help us accordingly. And that's quite interesting there. Um, logistics and location mapping. So you may have seen some videos, people like DHL got involved in this a few years ago. <coughs> uh, the big example that gets talked about a lot is when it comes to warehouses, when it comes to logistics, when it comes to um, identifying different products uh, in, in a large warehouse, you need to be given very opti optimized uh, logistical instructions or navigation instructions, um, both to collect a package, to log that you have the package, and also to tell you where to place the package. Now, every time you have to refer to something in the physical world, that creates inefficiencies. So if I have to refer to a flipboard, if I have to refer to my mobile phone, if I have to refer to something else and then look back at the item, all of that, we lose seconds and those seconds add up to minutes. Those minutes add up to hours when you're talking about a large population of people. And when you're talking about a global level, then that is many years of people time lost. So obviously there are lots of efficiencies that can be gained by employing augmented reality technology here. And then the final area, this is a fairly obvious one, but there are a few bits and pieces in here, maybe not so obvious, the retail and consumer space. So we know all about gaming. Gaming has been uh, very positive for the industry. Uh, gamers generally are very early adopters or innovators on the, the adoption curve of technology. So they are willing to spend the, the money. They're willing to test things that are not yet necessarily ready for mainstream adoption just because they are so excited about what they can do with it. They want to be the first to test it. They want to be the first to try it and engage with it. So they've been helping to bolster the VRAR industry and uh, to provide feedback, to provide well-needed funding for it, and so on. But other areas now are experiencing a boon, as we've seen all along there, but also in consumer experiences and retail processes. So retail processes, I mean things like uh, ASOS, a uh, very famous um, British company that is delivering uh, packages, uh, their fashion and apparel uh, packages to, to people um, all over the place. Now they've used augmented reality so you can get a better idea of what someone looks like wearing these clothes in the real world. So you can put a two scale model in the real world in front of you. 
and then look all around it and see how it looks. Now, you've also may have heard of magic, magic mirrors that some retailers have uh, started to invest in. They allow you to try before you buy. We should be able to see much more of that. And perhaps during the COVID crisis, we'll see some of that coming home to us. So where we're able to perhaps, you know, use our, our uh, mobile uh, phone cameras and, and look at ourselves in a, in a selfie sort of fashion and see how the clothing would look on us. That is already possible with certain items like jewelry, like makeup, uh, watches, and so on. That makes absolute sense because you can just point your mobile phone at your wrist and at wrist and see that watch. Wow, it looks you know it looks good on me. I'll I'm I'm happy to go with that. You know, whereas it's quite difficult to do that translation just by looking on an on a page on Amazon, for example. And then finally, consumer experiences. Uh, would also include understanding consumer behaviors. And I'll talk a little bit about, I have an example of, of what we're doing in PwC, which will bring this to life a little bit further on. Wonderful. Uh, before we move on, uh, Jeremy, yeah. of course, I think, I think that's a great uh, representation. Yeah, we have here five massive buckets yeah, of, um, of future benefits. Uh, and I think you explained that uh, very well. Are there are there specific questions around that? Because we touch obviously a lot of uh, a lot of industries uh, and examples. And I think it's a nice representation. These kind of five five times three hundred. I, I I simplify. Yeah. So I mean it's a uh, um, but but they are. So do do we have questions here in the audience? How much how much are games inside the last bucket? I mean, what's the percentage of games out of the 284 million billion sorry good question uh to be honest i can't recall off the top of my head but i definitely okay. have a more detailed version of this uh, in a spreadsheet and i can definitely uh, get you the answer I'll, I'll add you as a friend hiker and um, i'll okay. send you the information after this that's great Thanks. okay cool uh, other, okay. other questions one question, one, yeah. one question here um, yeah how do you assess um, the difference between VR and AR within these buckets? Or do you have a, at PwC a more, let's say, differentiated view between the two technologies? Yes, yes, we do. And I will give you a slide on the, uh, on the, the different impact between how it splits into virtual reality and augmented reality. Uh, I think I have it in, yeah, two slides on. So I'll talk about that then. But uh, to also answer your question, the way that we differentiate, and in fact, the way that we did a lot of this analysis is by using uh, the, the views of our own virtual reality and augmented reality team, by using the views of our economics team, by bringing in analyst data on things like uh, the expected adoption of headsets throughout different countries and and to do with different use cases and industries. And we basically put all of that information together to come up with this economic model. Um, and I've, I've seen the economic model, it's, uh, it's very complicated. It's got more than 30 Excel tabs uh, and it's got thousands and tens of thousands of rows. Uh, but basically what it does is it tries to understand how different countries are interacting, what the size of their different industries are, and then combines that information with where we see the impact on VR and AR and where we have already seen the impact of VR and AR in those industries, in those particular use cases, which we then extrapolate to try and form this view. So it's all this information combining together and sometimes being extrapolated from past views to give us this outlook into the future. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Would be great if you could share the model, but I think that's not possible. <laughs> <laughs> Our economic team may not be too keen, but uh, I can <laughs> certainly introduce you to them. And they're always happy to take questions. They yeah. told me if anyone has any deeper questions about the economic methodology, they'd be happy to answer them. Equally, I also have a, um, a, a blog entry that was written by one of the economists who worked on this product. Um, and uh, they've written a bit of an explanation actually about um, about how they came about all this information or, or how they went about creating this model. So that's public information. We can definitely share that with you. Great, thanks. No problem, no problem. Okay. Um, and in fact, me. actually on that question, I'm just gonna quickly jump to this point here uh, because you might find it interesting that 
uh, Germany actually in Europe we see as being uh, the the leading European country in terms of the the economic impact of virtual reality and augmented reality technology. So uh, you'll see we didn't do uh, an analysis on every country in the world. If we did, we would probably uh, we probably wouldn't be finished until the end of this year, uh, as opposed <laughs> to the end of last year. So we took a few select countries like Germany, Finland, UK, France, the US, the United Arab Emirates, China, and Japan. And then at the bottom there, we took a world view. Um, and what you're seeing is, you know, a pretty significant impact to, uh, to Germany's economy, 100, uh, just over $100 billion by 2030. Um, and the little, the, the little uh, person icon there indicates the number of jobs that are enhanced by VR or AR technology by 2030. So almost half a minute, half, uh, 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 that should be, that should be in millions. Have I got that right? No, that's in, yeah, that's in thousands. So it should be almost half a million uh, jobs impacted or, or enhanced. So positively affected by VR and AR technologies by 2030. Yeah, so um, I good. will go back a little bit. You'll have some time mm -hmm. to look through that if you'd like. But this is the, this is the end result of this. Um, in 2019, we expected that VRAR technologies already was having a close to $50 billion impact on the global economy. By 2025, we expect it to be nearly um, half a trillion. And then by 2030, we expect it to hit $1.5 trillion. So quite a big number there to, uh, to put on VRAR in terms of contribu contributions to the global economy by 2030. But as you've seen from the previous slide, there are a lot of areas where VRAR can help. And e even, even with the current COVID crisis, it will be uh, temporary in comparison to this analysis to 2030. Even if we are hit, let's say, for a year or a year and a half, we're only talking about shunting this figure a year or a year and a half out. If the, if the world changes to such a significant extent and such a permanent extent that we are, we basically changed the way that we work and live, and a lot of people are now working from home, that could also be beneficial to VRAR technologies in a way yeah. that we hadn't predict predicted here, which will help to balance out that view. So the view from our economists is uh, the, the analysis that was done on VRAR uh, is, is still valid despite the COVID-19 crisis. However, the timeline may not be exact in that 1.5 trillion may not be exactly at 2030 now. It may be 2031. Uh, maybe it, it might even be closer than that due to the, uh, the, the greater interest in the world on virtual reality and augmented reality. So I think it's, it's not a disastrous message for the VRAR industry in any case. Yeah, that's true. I think it's a good place to be. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And um, I think, uh, who was it that was asking about, um, uh, it was Rolf, wasn't it? You were asking about the split between VR and AR, right? So here we see the split. Yes. Uh, this is how we've, we've cut it. Uh, the orange line there at the bottom, that is uh, the, if you look at the 2030 end here, that's the 1.5 trillion split between AR and VR. VR contributing about 451. And then by 2030, and AR contributing uh, more than double that, uh, just over a trillion dollars by 2030. And the reason for that uh, is because there, there are two big reasons. One is that augmented reality use cases lend themselves very well to items and processes in the real world. And there are more things we need to do currently in the real world than we have in the virtual world. So obviously there are a lot more uh, applications uh, or greater applications in terms of the revenue figures and the market figures for augmented reality than virtual reality. And secondly, in terms of the accessibility of the technology, currently augmented reality is far more accessible. So in our pockets now, uh, you know, there are more smartphones than people in this planet. Uh, we are, we've got uh, the, the phones that are coming out now are increasing in terms of their technology to the extent that we can have very high fidelity 
uh, augmented reality experiences in terms of these devices like the iPad Pro, for example, but even my, my iPhone uh, uh, X or the XS can understand the environment. It knows where the surfaces are, it knows where the floors are, where the walls are, where the ceiling is. So it can put uh, furniture in your real world environment. So you can look around it, see how it looks. You can make, you can make reasonably uh, accurate measurements, you know, in terms of uh, for domestic uh, purposes using the augmented reality technology on our mobile phones now. So uh, the two reasons then for why AR is much greater than VR in terms of its contribution to the economy. One is its greater accessibility and two uh, is the fact that uh, we, we have far more use cases in the real world than we do in the virtual world. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. There's a question. Yeah. 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 Um, so, so um, do you see uh, like emerging of the two technologies in the in the near future? I mean, right now it's probably not feasible. Uh, everything like the Hololens or these AR headsets have to be, you know, passed through, and the VR yeah. don't. I mean, there's already once uh, like one of those uh, headsets where you, you like pass through, uh, but eventually everyone is kind of like aiming for the universal one that does it all. And then yeah. that differentiation that you did might not be the one we're looking for, or, or that, that would change. The yeah, numbers. I see what you mean. Yeah, I would say that right. I, I expect it. I expect virtual reality and augmented reality devices to converge into a single device that gives us both virtual reality and augmented reality. Um, however, even in that case, this analysis still stands because you, you, you still, even though you have one device, you still have two technologies. You have augmented reality, which is in the real world and we're augmenting that. And you have virtual reality, which is a completely uh, virtual environment. And we use those two technologies for different purposes. So in VR, a lot of it is for, is for training when you're trying to put yourself in a completely different environment. Um, and you can't do that in augmented reality. So if I was doing uh, training on you know, constructing a very complicated satellite system, and it usually needs to be done, um, you know, in the middle of a, let's say, for example, uh, a, a war zone where you've got, you know, bullets flying past and things, you know, bombs dropping overhead, you need to be able to perform that operation in that environment. But that's very difficult to replicate in the real world. Um, so instead, we can do it in virtual reality with relative ease. And that, that sort of makes sense in terms of creating efficiencies for us. However, in, aug in augmented reality, if I wanted to learn um, how to, uh, let's say, um, think of a good example. So I wanted to be able to perform uh, actions on a certain piece of machinery. Augmented reality lends itself better than virtual reality, although it is possible in VR, simply because you have the, uh, the sense of touch in the real world. You're able to actually go to a machine and be given instructions on that exact machine as opposed to a, a virtual replica. So there will still be a differentiation in terms of the use cases and where we use each technology, even when they are both delivered through the same device. Does that make sense? Yes, perfect. Thanks. Perfect, perfect. Anyone else have any questions about this? Yeah, very good. So next slide. Now we've talked a little bit about this. Um, I've mentioned that we did our analysis on a select number of uh, countries in the world based on where we saw uh, significant potential for the technology. Now, the big, uh, the big news items here, not necessarily surprising. The US uh, is in the lead um, in terms of the economic impact on the world. Uh, due to VRAR technologies at um, at half a, a trillion dollars there. Uh, within Europe, Germany is, is the leader here, and then we have the UK following behind. Uh, and then in East Asia, we have big powerhouses like China, Japan. And although we didn't do an analysis, I would also expect um, South Korea and maybe even Australia to some extent to be contributing significantly as well there. So we're just about halfway through, but I want to make sure uh, that we wrap up with a good amount of time left. So let me know, Michael, if you want me to speed up or anything. Yeah, a little bit, maybe. Yeah, yeah no yeah. worries. 
So here we have a number of of just examples that I like to draw out sometimes of different industries that are already using virtual reality and augmented reality right now and have already uh, implemented it uh, and are gaining benefit from it. So to just run you through a few examples, I talked about ASOS, um, Coca-Cola, they're using augmented reality to help their sales representatives to show what it would be like to have a Coca-Cola fridge in your environment. So if you're a convenience store or you're a bar or anything like that, uh, there are many different types of Coca-Cola fridges, different dimensions, different, uh, uh, different power requirements. Some are sit on the table, some sit on the, the floor and they're tall, some are short. Um, but Coca-Cola has a way now of using their mobile phone or tablet to take it to the environment and to show the person, the client they're trying to sell to, this is what it would look like in your environment. So using, I guess you'd call it a form of mixed reality, where the device knows what the floor and the, the walls are, you can put an actual fridge digitally into the real world environment and say, look, actually it fits very nicely there, what do you think? And then you can have a conversation with the client about maybe they want a, a slightly smaller fridge because they have other plans for the rest of the space and so on. So that's quite interesting. Uh, a lot of you may have heard about the Walmart use case. The fact that they are using right now nearly 20,000 virtual reality headsets in all of their stores across the US uh, to help train their employees. And the, the, the training modules are absolutely, uh, they are so diverse. Uh, I think it's close to, it's more than 50 training modules now in virtual reality that Walmart has. Everything from how to deal with a, a Black Friday sales rush um, you may have seen the news items. The Americans tend to get very excited when it comes to big sales like Black Fridays. So excited that the, uh, the store staff have to be trained in how to deal with the hordes of customers that are launched themselves into these stores uh, during the sales day. Um, that's, not all over. To... That's, that, that's, that's not over with social distancing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that might be over. They might, the, the, the stores might have a little bit of a respite uh, this year thanks to COVID-19. But they also have training to do with active shooter training. So what happens when you have someone come in with a gun that is trying to rob you? How do you react? What do you do? What do you respond to them uh, by saying? And they have uh, training in virtual reality to help deal with that. They have training to help deal with how do you talk to customers? How do you engage with them? Um, you know, when someone's being very difficult or where you need to get them more information, how do you respond? Um, there is training at Walmart to do with new machines. You know, how do you help customers with the click and collect type points in machinery that's coming out? And they are, they, I think, from what I remember, Walmart is the biggest employer in the world. So they have a lot of people to train. So it's, it's great that they are using virtual reality to help uh, to conduct effective training for this large number of people. McLaren, I've talked about using VR to design vehicles. Um, American Airlines using virtual reality to train cabin crew, Boeing using augmented reality to help wire up the plane, Foster and Partners using VR to help visualize new architectures, uh, Bank of Ireland using virtual reality for collaboration, much like uh, you know, a meeting like this amongst the team. So a lot of interesting use cases there. And at the end of the day, if you're thinking about virtual reality or you're thinking about VR and AI use cases, they need to solve one of these problems preferably. So these are the big business problems. At the end of the day, whatever you're doing, whatever you're trying to sell to business, generally the end result is one or more of these, issue, of these uh, opportunities. You wanna reduce cost, grow revenue, remove complexities in the organization, or you wanna try and create more operational efficiencies. So this is something we always think back to at PwC when we're trying to figure out, uh, is VR and AR useful here or is it just a gimmick? Uh, because if it is just a gimmick and it doesn't help with some of these problems, then we have a potential issue. If not now, then at least further down the line. And this is the workflow that we follow whenever we're talking to clients. We start from the beginning discover. This is helping them to understand the technology because education is still a massive issue in, in, in the world. 
not in terms of uh, people's level of education, but in terms of their understanding of virtual reality and augmented reality technology. What can this tech do? How are our competitors using it? Um, what, what does it mean when we have, uh, what's the difference between a Google Cardboard and an Oculus Quest? What's the difference between a Microsoft HoloLens um, and a Google Glass type technology? You know, VR and AR is such a wide spectrum of technologies. Now, it's very difficult to pinpoint, you know, this is VR and that's AR. We, we very much move away from, uh, you know, these single point definitions where we try to encompass a wide spectrum, which covers, you know, everything from mobile phone based augmented reality through to, you know, very high end uh, AR headsets like the HoloLens. Um, and all the way through from the Google Cardboards of the world through to, you know, maybe the Vario XR1s that are being used in heavy industry right now. Once a client understands what all about the technology, that's when we can help them start to design uh, a potential solution when they know what the valuable um, ideas and use cases are. Once they understand that and what could be useful, then it goes on to develop. Now, this is the software development side of things. And interestingly as well, this is an area that most people think of only when it comes to virtual reality and augmented reality. And the problem is there's a lot on either side of software development. Yes, you need software. However, you need to think about how that software is going to act for the customer. You need to understand the value of VR and AR technology to help inform the design. And once you've created the software, you then need to be able to deploy it in an organization and also collect and analyze the data to help inform your next iteration of the technology and so on and so, so, on and so forth, the cycle goes. So to give you an example of some of the things that we've worked on, uh, this is a conference that we ran with close to 300 people. And it was a, con a real world conference, so a physical conference, everybody flew in throughout the world, but we used virtual reality here to put these nearly 300 people in a cybersecurity crisis application. So for 15 minutes, they had to make decisions in this world as to what, uh, you know, whether they were going to pay the ransomware, whether they're going to pay the Bitcoin on the ransomware attack or not, whether they were going to speak to the press in a transparent or a, um, a cautious way, whether they were going to, uh, you know, um, prioritize the website first to bring that back online after it was brought down by the hacker, or whether they prioritize their internal CRM system. It was really interesting. We collected all the data in real time of all of these users, what, what decisions they were making. And I presented it on screen afterwards immediately. So we could have a discussion about why they made those decisions. This is the example I want to talk to talk about when I was when I mentioned consumer behaviors. So this is a little application we produced in Unity uh, to help understand uh, a customer journey when they are considering buying a house, for example. So this path here shows where they walked, you know, from beginning to end throughout the house. Um, these little blocks here, the green and red blocks, they show what the uh, user was looking at and for how long they were looking at it. And we also had questions in this environment relating to the kitchen up there. For example, you know, do you prefer gas, uh, electric or induction hobs? Um, and all of that data was collected and, um, and, then and then saved on the headset for analysis in uh, you know, Excel and, and our usual spreadsheet analysis software like that. Now, this is a picture of me at Microsoft's Dimension Studio in South London. Uh, this was interesting because uh, who, if you put your hand up here, who has uh, who knows about or has heard of volumetric capture before? OK, one, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, the majority of people. Excellent. Very good. So for those who don't, very quickly, volumetric capture is like the best of 360 video and the best of computer generated graphics. It's a way of capturing you as a 3D model using your real world appearance and, uh, and actions and movements. And we've been using that in corporate communications. So if we're trying to get a message across 
to a large portion of our users. You know, we've got 20, 23,000 people in the UK. Uh, this was an example of taking that volumetric capture that we did and then implementing it in the real world through a mobile phone, which was really cool. So despite what you may think, we managed to optimize this, this model so that it could be downloaded and accessed on a mobile phone, your own mobile phone, and then displayed in the real world. So this is our office here, and this is a volumetric capture of, uh, of one of our colleagues. Nice. And here, this is a very interesting um, application that we ran with over 2,000 of our people around soft skills training. So we used virtual reality, we've used virtual reality in-house for many different trainings now. We've used it for uh, commercial acumen training. We've used it for diversity and inclusion training. Uh, we've used it for um, empathy training. And uh, this is just a screenshot of one of the VR experiences where you have to actually, you have to talk uh, to activate the next step. So you have to make a decision about what you're going to say, um, and then you have to say it. And then based on what you say, you get given feedback about whether that was the right thing to do or not. Um, and it's really interesting. Through, through this, uh, this study, we've actually learned that VR-trained employees are 340% more confident in employing what they've learned versus, versus traditional um, e-learning methods. That's a great number. I think um, that's impressive. Yeah. And then this also, we found out that employees trained in VR actually need less time. So VR trained students required 53% less time than classroom training and even 33% less time than e-learning. And we also have results relating to the financial. So at what point does VR training become cheaper per user? Than, uh, than even than classroom training or even e-learning, for example. And we nice. have Tra those figures Tracy, as well, have... which we're going to release in a month's time. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Tracy, do you have a question? Yeah, um, I just, I'm actually um, a trainer. So I use virtual reality training in Myanmar. And yeah. I'm a hospitality trainer. Um, I just wanted to see, the, we, don't, we don't have any actual research of anything like you have here. Is it possible that we can use this or is this only... Yeah, yeah, time? definitely. So these, these two slides I put down here, you're absolutely welcome to, uh, to quote them um, because they are public. Uh, the rest of these statistics, uh, they will be released next month in a fully public write-up. Yeah, it's, it's these ones that concern me because it's mainly soft skills training that we're conducting. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Right. Feel free yeah, to take okay, the take the uh, statistics and use them. Yeah. 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 So we send we send uh, we send the slides around uh, afterwards, um, and and yeah, then then you can use that. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. So, I will talk a little bit about challenges to the adoption of this technology because uh, I said before that the, the the COVID crisis could be advantageous for the VRAR industry in terms of pushing people towards thinking more positively about the technology. But we shouldn't forget that the majority of people still don't have access to this equipment, which is an issue when we're talking about mainstream adoption of the tech. Yes. From an enterprise perspective, it's easier, of course, because uh, in an enterprise, you have a more closed ecosystem. You have the ability for someone at the top to make a decision and for that to be uh, dictated to the rest of the workforce to a large extent. But in wider society, in the consumer world, for B2C applications, it is a far uh, tougher um, uh, sell to them because obviously they have to make the investment financially. They have to make the investment mentally. Uh, they have to be prepared culturally in terms of how to engage with this technology in a new way that they're not used to before. Um, and that's going to take time. And I think... Uh, on one hand, you have people who are very impatient and think that the VR industry is dead because it hasn't taken off yet. Uh, and on the other side, you have people who, uh, who, who already believe that you know, we, we, we're past the point of, uh, of VR AR being mainstream now. So if anyone's seen Gartner's hype cycle, they've removed virtual reality from the hype cycle. So because they don't consider it a technology that is on an emerging curve anymore because it's being sold in stores now, the headsets, then it's no longer 
part of the definition of an emerging technology, according to them. So it's interesting. I think the truth is somewhere in the middle, where yeah. I don't believe by any means that VR is dead uh, or is going to die. I think it's already proven itself. Uh, I think it's certainly been in hibernation mode for a large part of the 90s, but we now have we now have access to enough processing power at a reasonable cost um, and in a reasonable format to make it start to be accessible for that first tranche of, of innovators who are an early adopters of technology. And we should expect to see more and more people adopt it as it gets pushed out and as the headsets become lighter, uh, cheaper, more accessible, more comfortable, more acceptable in the world. So I've covered quite a few points there. Cost, user experience, headsets are becoming uh, less complicated. So uh, hands up if you had an externally tracked VR headset at some point, like a Vive or an Oculus Rift, or if you're using one right now. Yeah, quite a lot of us, yeah, including me. Now, the great thing is, I mean, well, starting with the negative, that's a bit of a pain, you know, for the, for the, for the, for the regular consumer. They don't want to set up you know, tripods and put base stations up and plug them in uh, and do all this work when, you know, they, they're used to just taking their mobile phone out of their pocket and swiping unlock and that's it, they're ready to go. So the fact that you've got headsets now that have inside out tracking, like the Oculus Quest, like the Pico Neo 2, uh, like even the Lenovo Mirage to a large extent, uh, it's great to see those headsets come on the market and the fact that we're gonna be seeing even more uh, of those improvements means we should see more adoption of these technologies. Content is has always been a problem, but it's becoming less of a problem, uh, particularly now as we're starting to see uh, content providers in the consumer world actually benefit from big gambles. So the, the latest one being Half-Life Alex. Has anyone played Half-Life Alex? Hands up on this one. This could be less people, but. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, no there one, in fact. So yeah, I've, well, yeah. I've not only played Half-Life Alex, see. but I've finished it. Fantastic oh, well. game. Yeah, yeah, I finished it just this weekend. And I 100% recommend if you ever played Half-Life or if you're interested in, uh, uh, in, in, in seeing a sort of cutting edge of, of VR gaming, Half-Life Alex is a great, uh, a great experience to try. And the fact is it's already received rave reviews from all over the world. Everybody is amazed by it. It's, it's had almost as much of an impact as Half-Life 1 has had, um, which is brilliant to see. Um, and then, of course, you have famous titles like Beat Saber. Uh, and, um, and, and, and what else have you got? You've got, of course, Pokemon Go, very well known. Um, but lots of titles are now making millions um, of, of dollars. And that's great for the industry because it shows people that you can, uh, you can sustain yourself on some products. Uh, it's unfortunately not the reality for, for, for most uh, VR producers, but the fact that some people have broken through is a shining light for the industry and for investors in the industry. Absolutely. Good. I and then I will leave you on a final yep. note yes. yep. uh, over here. So tips for businesses. If you're looking at implementing VR or AR or you're talking to companies that are thinking of implementing VR and AR, number one, focus on solving business problems. So always, when, where, as you're having a conversation with a business, always try to get them to the point of what problem are they trying to solve or equivalently, what opportunity are they trying to take advantage of and keep referring back to that throughout the project so you don't lose the way. Secondly, think about more than just the software. It's more than just developing the software. Think about the deployment. Think about the data that comes from it. Think about the design of that solution and design of the software, but also design of the deployment, the implementation. How is it going to look? Is it one to one, you know, headsets per person or is it one headset to many people? Is it headsets in a certain training center or is it headsets sent to people now, you know, during the COVID crisis? And how do you make that work? Uh, create a seamless experience. So especially if you're going to be sending headsets to people who've never tried VR, how do you create a workflow that is, is, is VR for dummies? So it's impossible for people to get wrong. And it's just very clear, very easy to, to understand with the least steps needed. Get stuck in with a test case. Companies, especially now during the COVID crisis, are not going to be willing to put lots of money 
into the R&R solutions. However, if it benefits them, they may be willing to put some money into a smaller prototype that then proves the value. With that proof, you can then go on to step five, measure the result, show that it's adding value, and then act accordingly. Then you can get the remit and the, the belief in building out a much bigger solution and a more widely spread solution for a larger, uh, a bigger project and a larger amount of money. And, uh, and remember, it's not always about making sure it's, uh, it's a success. Sometimes, despite your best efforts, it simply may not work. And even learning that at a small scale level is advantageous instead of going all out, spending a lot of money and then realizing that it doesn't quite fit. So those would be our top tips. And um, thanks for listening, everyone. Happy to take any questions you have at the moment. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Uh, it was really, really interesting and inspiring. Thank you. Lots of applause here. Uh, I think uh, yeah, uh, everyone knows now hearts and applause. Um, coming up, um, <laughs> which is really nice to see. So we have some, some good news quickly, um, and then I open the floor again for questions. Um, we, the slides are available, um, and Oliver um, already set up um, business.club slash slides, so you can actually download the slides here um, of this presentation, which I think is really nice, and then you can look it up. Um, and obviously reach out to Jeremy as well, friend him here so that you are connected in alt space. So that's um, the good news here on that side. Um, is just go on the, on the website vrbusiness.club slash slides. Yeah, so very simple. Uh, you only have to remember slash slides, which isn't too hard. Um, and then just go on the, on the VR Business Club uh, homepage. So that's for that. Any questions? So I would like to open the floor. I have one question as well, but I want to open the floor here if you have any further questions to Jeremy. Yeah, and no worries. If not, I'm more than happy fine, to yeah. uh, send that information on the methodology uh, that we yeah. talked about earlier. Um, I know we've answered a few questions already during the presentation. Exactly. Yeah, which I think is any I other one. Here. Oh, yeah, yeah, uh, Tracy. Yeah, sorry, it's me again. Um, not not so much of a question, but I just wanted to say I've been to quite a few um, events in Alt Space, and you have been the best so far. So this was really, really oh, fantastic. fantastic! Yeah, yeah, oh, brilliant! Good. Thank you very much, Tracy. I appreciate it. Oh, well, thank you, Tracy. That's that's great. Yeah, uh, lots of energy, and I think a lot of positive information, and 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 how you presented that, Jeremy. One question from my side. Um, so, so you clustered the things and you, you showed a lot of kind of the opportunities. How much thinking has been uh, has been going into the the question around new business models? Because what what and, and I know it's a very broad question, but maybe um, as a as a trigger question for future discussions as well. Because when we look at the internet, then the first I'd say at least 10, 15 years, yeah, the the, the internet re replicated what was already in the in the physical world. Uh, and I think a lot of what we are seeing here is also very similar. Yeah, so it's kind of more yeah, doing the absolutely. same in a, in a different environment. But kind of, do you have a perspective on completely new business models? What's happening there? Yeah, I think um, I think you're absolutely right in the sense that uh, you had the internet try and copy the real world. You had television try and copy the radio world when television came out. And yes, we're definitely already seeing, and we will continue to see VR as a medium, uh, take the lessons from the only place it knows at the moment, which is the real world and other media like, like television and like the movies and so on. Um, as for how they're going to, as for the adaptation, it's definitely going to have to adapt because it is a new medium. It's a new form of input. It's a new form of output. You know, we're not messing around with keyboards and mice and touch screens anymore. We're not looking at static 2D screens. We are using, you know, our, our virtual hands. Uh, we're using 3D environments. We are using our voice, perhaps. We're using our gaze. Um, and we are interacting on, yes, a screen, but a screen that doesn't appear to be static to us. A screen that appears to, to change as we move our head. And, and hands in this world. So it's a very different modality. And to be honest with you, I don't think uh, it has matured to such an extent that we have a conclusion on the new business models of this modality yet. I think we can only look 
towards some of the early uh, explorations of this medium. So when we see things like virtual shopping, I'm thinking right now that virtual shopping, although it was a very niche area in the in the form of you know building a, in in virtual reality a whole shopping aisle and store for you, um, I think given the current COVID crisis, there may be a lot of scope for uh, for accelerating that type of thinking and actually bringing it to virtual reality and and making it uh, uh, and people adopting it far more quickly than we would imagine. But um, to be honest, there is not there hasn't been enough tests in the real world or in in virtual reality yet to form a conclusion on the viability and sustainability of these new business models. No, thank you. Thanks, Jeremy. And I think that's the task of entrepreneurs, yeah, which is also uh, nice to see and, and we'll, we'll explore a lot more. Any other questions? No? Um, yeah, maybe one. Oh, here's one. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, so we, we were looking at VR and AR very much exclusively as a technology, but like, what's your take on, I mean, me personally, I think the, the big power lies in, in the combination of IoT, AI, you mentioned AI, like, you know, uh, yeah. so that the, the head that uh, understands what's in front of you, the children and all these, like, uh, maybe your, your take on that, like the influence that will have yeah. that on, on the overall uh, development of VR and AI. Sure, sure. I think um, it's, it's an interesting one because I didn't mention it in this slide deck, but Virtual reality and augmented reality are two of many emerging technologies. Artificial intelligence is one, the Internet of Things is another, 3D printing, drones, and so on. Now, have you, has anyone heard of the term convergence before? Convergence, in this case, refers to the value of these emerging technologies when they come together. So when we talk about artificial intelligence and augmented reality. So the AI system is scanning the real world, understanding what we're seeing, and then delivering instructions to us through augmented reality. That's a great example of convergence. Uh, thinking about a completely different example, virtual reality and drones. So virtual reality is actually being used as a form of training for drone systems. So MIT is making drones think they're in a virtual reality environment and watching how they navigate through that environment. So if their navigation is not high quality enough, they can t tweak the algorithm and then send them again through the virtual reality environment. And that allows drones to practice in a safe environment. It allows humans to hone the algorithm for their navigation without the fear that they're going to you know, bash into anything, uh, you know, destroy themselves or, or destroy the physical environment or even it allows us to save space because we don't have to create a very complicated obstacle strewn environment anymore when we can have it all created virtually. So I think we need more of that thinking when it comes to convergence of emerging technologies. And in fact, if there was a sixth tip, that would probably be it. Don't consider yes. VR and AR in silos. Consider how they converge with other emerging technologies to provide even more value. I think that's a great point. Yeah, the convergence, by the way, um, a very nice uh, book recommendation here. And the future is faster than you think. The latest book from Peter Diamandis, and he talks exactly about the convergence of technologies, uh, which I think that's, that is actually the big driver. I mean, we all talk about expen exponential now in, in, the, in the COVID um, realm, but actually exponential has been the driver yeah, since of, uh, for, for many of these things. And the, and the mega driver is really this convergence uh, because um, one technology helps the other to improve and get better uh, faster and faster. That's, I think, I like, uh, Jeremy, that's my favorite um, example, what you just brought up, um, the drones uh, trained in virtual reality. I think that's like, <laughs> that's a really, yeah, really it's great. Uh, it's great. great example. Any other questions? Just raise your hand or I'll put the hand up. And otherwise, if not, no? Well, then again, thank you very much, Jerry. It was a great pleasure to have you here um, on the VR cast by the VR Business Club. Um, really great, um, entertaining, and insightful uh, session. And uh, yeah, all the best uh, to London and uh, through that um, difficult time you're going through, uh, especially in the UK as well. And I wish everyone much, else uh, a great uh, evening. Thank you.
Yeah. Have a great time, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye.